Chapter 1 The alarm buzzed at an annoying frequency to let John know it was time to get his ass out of bed. He rolled over to see that it was too damn early o'clock and smacked the thing down to shut it up. After putting on some tunes, John started his usual routine, shit, shower, and shave. He then washed down his breakfast of a fried egg sandwich with a glass of orange juice. John slid on his shoes and was about to grab his keys when the doorbell rang. He looked through the peephole. An older man in a stained trench coat over a black hoodie stood on the other side. John didn't recognize him. Then the man kicked the door in. The wood splintered as the door smacked John in the face. He fell backward as he tripped over his own feet and crashed to the floor. The man then stalked into John's apartment and lunged at him. John tried to get up but was too slow and the intruder tackled him back to the floor. John threw a couple of punches but the man batted them away as if they were mere flies. A mild annoyance. The man got his hands around John's neck and squeezed. But this man was strong for a geezer. John's eyes watered as his vision blurred. Then out of nowhere, a gust of wind burst into the room and suddenly there was someone else there. The newcomer grabbed the intruder from behind and pulled him off John. He took in a deep breath as he writhed on the floor. The newcomer also struggled with the intruder, but John saw his face. It was him. Then poof, another burst of air, and the two men were gone. John stumbled to his feet with a pain in his face and throat, found his phone, and dialed 911. Chapter 2 Because it took a while for the cops to arrive, John took frozen peas and put them on his neck. Pieces of his door covered the floor, and the handle was nowhere in sight. When the rollers finally arrived, a paramedic had preceded them and had already attended to John's health. Took you long enough, John said to no one. The first cop, whose badge said Winslow, was an older black man with a receding hairline. The second cop, who was significantly younger, was slim, tall, and had a military-style haircut. His badge said Ramirez. Morning, said Winslow. We got a report of a break-in. Yeah. John waved a hand at the mess that consumed his living room. Ramirez snapped pictures with a cell phone while he carefully stepped around the room. Did you recognize the person who attacked you? Winslow asked. It was two people, John said. So did either of the attackers look familiar? Ramirez had pulled out a tiny notebook from his chest pocket and wrote something down. No, John said. He was an older guy wearing an old dingy trench coat. I thought he might have been homeless or something. Ramirez, call it in, Winslow ordered. Yeah, all right. Ramirez stepped away and spoke a description into his shoulder radio. The other person saved my life, John said. The other intruder? Asked Winslow. Yes. And what did he look like? I didn't see his face. I don't know. John lied. He knew. He knew all too well. That second person, who had just appeared out of nowhere, looked like him. And there was this feeling in his gut that it was him. I didn't get a good look at him. Seems like you may have a guardian angel, said Ramirez. Any idea where they might have gone off to? Asked Winslow. John shook his head. I'm just thankful to be alive, he said. All right, let's get out of here, Winslow said. You might get a call to come down to the station later. Ramirez walked up and placed something in John's hand. For your door. He followed his partner out of the apartment. John stared at the thing in his hand. It was caution tape. Chapter 3 John secured his broken door as much as possible before leaving for work. He hoped the caution tape would deter any would-be thieves but knew his apartment building was secure. Before he could leave, 
A man wearing a suit and a trench coat approached him. John looked around, but no one else was present. It was the older man that had attacked him. He looked like he cleaned himself up. His clothes were pressed, his trench coat looked new, and his graying facial hair was non-existent. He looked younger. John took a step back. Back up, he said. Sir, relax, the man said. I'm Detective Doolittle. I'm here about a break-in and an assault. There is no way, John thought, that this is the same person. How had he changed so drastically and so quickly? They sent the person who had tried to kill him. Apartment 33, right? The man said. I need to ask you. John bolted before Doolittle could finish his sentence. He pushed past him and ran out of the apartment building. Hey! Doolittle yelled. John ignored him. He ran past the parking garage and onto the bustling street. As he weaved through the people passing him in all directions, he looked back to see Doolittle not far behind, with his badge in the air. John saw a bus coming down the street, so he jumped into traffic to get to it. Brakes screeched and horns blared at him as he avoided becoming roadkill. The passengers loaded the bus and it started to pull away. He pushed his legs to move faster. The bus driver nearly jumped out of her seat when he banged on the door. She stopped immediately to let him in. Boy, you nearly gave me a heart attack, she said. Sorry, he said, slapping the card on the reader. It beeped, and a green light blinked on it. He took a seat, and the bus continued. As he took a seat by a window, he saw Doolittle's run stop. John sighed in relief. Chapter 4 Detective Eddie Doolittle stood in the middle of the intersection as the bus pulled away at a speed he could not keep by simply running. Why did this idiot that? Doolittle just needed a statement. This was definitely peculiar. He pulled out a cigarette and lit it, taking a long drag before flicking it to the ground. He walked back to his car parked in front of the apartments. He fumbled with the keys while looking at the apartment building, then stopped before opening the car door. Doolittle went inside the apartment building to number 33. There was tape and broken wood where the door handle should be. Doolittle pushed, and the door nearly collapsed, being held only by the bottom hinge. As he entered, a nosy neighbor walked by. He simply held up his badge and said, Police. The neighbor moved on. The neatness of the apartment instantly disgusted Doolittle. Other than a pile of degree swept in a corner, the place was spotless. He surveyed the living room and the kitchen, but found nothing to tell him who this guy was or where he worked. Doolittle just needed to ask the man some questions, get some clues, and so on. The damn idiot ran before Doolittle could get a word out. But that look on his face when he saw Doolittle, it was like he'd seen a ghost. What was that about? Doolittle went into the bathroom, but still found nothing to clue him into this dude. He took a cigarette and lit it. He took a long drag from his cigarette, exhaled the smoke into the air, and then flicked it into the toilet. He made his way into the bedroom. The elegant bed annoyed him. He rummaged through a couple of drawers and nightstands but found nothing. He sat on the bed and put a cigarette to his lips, but saw something on the floor before he could light it. It peeked from under the bed like it was trying to hide. Hello, you, Doolittle said, picking up the employee badge from the floor. A picture of the guy was on the front, with a smile beaming across his face. Below the mugshot was his name, Jonathan Compton. Under that was his title, Public and Media Relations, and at the bottom, a small company logo. Chapter 5 John hopped on several buses until he was sure he wasn't being followed. Doolittle was his name. John had barely caught it before running for his life. Why would this attacker come back? When the last bus dropped him off, he was two hours late. So several blocks from his job, he walked from there. 
Near the city's border sat a tall one-story, round-shaped building with a pyramid-shaped roof. Giant letters across the top said Link Connections. John patted himself, but couldn't find his badge, so he climbed the metal gate surrounding his workplace. He banged on the double glass doors and was buzzed in. Late again, but this time it wasn't his fault. In the lobby, he saw his favorite person on earth, Maria. She was on the phone behind the lobby desk. She glared at him as he walked over. She looked remarkable in a plain v-neck gray shirt and tight blue jeans that hugged her curves. She was very short, had green eyes, and long brown hair. She hung up the phone and blasted him with a barrage of Spanish. In English, John said with his hands up. You are two hours late, mister, she said. Reeves has me running around doing your job, answering phones and talking to idiots on the phone about complicated mathematical computations they're too stupid to comprehend. Uh, yeah, about that, he started. So what's the excuse this time? She asked. Someone broke into my place and tried to kill me. What? Are you serious? Yes, I even have the bruises to prove it. John showed Maria his neck, where the detective tried to strangle him. It was still sore. He winced as she poked his neck. Ah, he said. It still hurts. That's what you get for being late. Uh, but I told you. Tell me on the way to the accelerator, she said. It'll buy you some time before Reeves chews your head off. Link Connections lobby led to two areas, the offices and the warehouse. Inside the warehouse sat the jewel of Link Connections, the particle accelerator. John had minimal knowledge of the contraption, but he was told it was used to study protons, electrons, or some other kind of trons. He paid very little attention to the science of it. They hired him as an image and media consultant. He made them look pleasant to the rest of the world. John felt small near the particle accelerator. He worried about the size and magnitude of the dome-shaped device and what it could do. Protons and electrons, atoms and other particles, are split apart and moved at supernatural speeds. Maria had made it very clear that one wrong calculation won't just be the atoms being torn apart, it would be the entire city too. The massive machine took up most of the space in the warehouse. It was nearly the length of a football field and the shape of a dome with cylindrical nodes ejecting from all over it. A walkway with a guardrail led to a small control room next to the accelerator. The room was full of advanced technology that monitored and maintained the accelerator. There were supposedly a billion miles of superconducting wire inside of it. John feared the particle accelerator and what it was capable of, but luckily for him, it was still non-operational. When he and Maria entered the control room, Michael was there, adjusting knobs and punching things into the keyboard. Hello there, he said. Michael wore a plain black shirt with some black slacks and black shoes. His black hair, although disheveled, flowed down past his shoulders. He looked like he belonged in a metal band, not handling complex computations. A red light pulsated suddenly, along with an alarm that blasted their ears. What was that? John asked. That, good sir, is a false alarm, Michael said. I hope. Damn. Things have been going off all morning. You're late. Yeah, John said. Someone broke into my place and tried to kill me. No shit, Michael asked. Really, look. John pulled his collar to show his neck wounds. I just told Maria. Sounds a little far-fetched if you ask me, Maria said. Why is that? Michael asked. Oh, he'll tell you, she said. Oh, do tell. Michael said, but before John could say anything, the red light flashed rapidly and the alarm blared again. Otra vez, she said. What are you doing to her? Maria dashed over to a computer. Her fingers moved like lightning on the keyboard. Her? John asked. She means Beulah, Michael said. 
Who the fuck is Beulah? John asked. We are not calling her that, Maria said. That was the name of my pet cow growing up, Michael said. No one cares, Maria said. Has it really been doing this all morning? Ouch. Michael held a hand over his chest. And yes, the computer keeps reading a weight disturbance. It shouldn't be operational, she said. She isn't, Michael replied. But Reeves asked me to put her in test mode. Then, both the light and the alarm stopped. There, Maria said. I put a bypass for now, but one of us will probably have to check it out later. That's a relief, Michael said. So, are you going to tell me about your break-in? Maria and Michael both looked at John, who just stood there in awe of the two brilliant minds. Then, what sounded like a radio being turned on broke the silence. Testing! Testing! A voice spoke from the speaker. Michael pressed the button on his keyboard and spoke into the microphone that protruded from it. Coming in loud and clear, boss. Good. John, to my office. Now! How did he even know I was here? John asked. Oh, I got the security cameras working this morning. They're live, Michael said with a grin from ear to ear. Chapter 7 John left Maria and Michael to their devices and headed back through the warehouse. He felt a chill when he passed the accelerator, the sound of a clanking metal coming from inside it. Before he reached the exit, Maria called from behind him. Wait up, she said. I'll go with you so you don't have to face the dragon alone. Thanks, he said. Reeves really can't be that mad, can he? Even he has to understand. Shit happens. It's Reeves. She said with an expression of, did you just say that? The two of them re-entered the lobby and headed straight to the offices. And, she added, he has been on edge about the city's hold on activating the accelerator. <laughs> Beulah, though? John said. I am not calling her that. Reeves' office was on the second floor of the building. He sat at his desk, conversing with some man who sat across from him. Reeves was a blue-eyed devil in a sleek black suit with a matching tie. He looked and smelled like money. The windows behind him displayed an excellent view of the city. Ah, he said as John and Maria walked in. Here he is now. The man sitting across from Reeves stood up. John could feel his gut twist as he noticed the familiar trench coat. John, this is Detective Doolittle, the man said as he turned to face John. Detective Doolittle. John froze. He grabbed Maria by the arm. That's him, he whispered. Who? she asked. The guy who attacked me this morning, John said. I wouldn't call trying to get a statement and you running away scared attacking you, but to each his own, Doolittle said. He told me all about what happened this morning, Reeves said. It explains why you're late. You could have called me. I would have given you the day off. Really? John asked. No, but I would have at least considered it. Possibly. Well, this is all fine and dandy, but if you don't mind... Doolittle looked at Reeves. I still have some questions for Mr. Compton. John said nothing. How did this detective even find him? Then he saw the badge in the detective's hand. With everything that happened that morning, he forgot to grab it when he left. Doolittle must have gone back to his apartment and found it. The lunchroom is one door over, Reeves said. You can question him there. Unexpectedly, the building rumbled and shook. Then a voice came blaring through Reeves' intercom. Boss? You need to get down here, Michael said. What's the issue? Reeves asked. I'm picking up several anomalies in the accelerator, Michael said. Shit, Reeves cursed. You two can stay here. Maria, come with me. Reeves stormed out of the office. Maria patted John on the shoulder. Be careful, she said before leaving. John was alone in the office with the detective. The two just stood in silence for a brief second before Doolittle reached into his coat pocket for something. Hey, what are you reaching for? John held his arms up to protect himself. Doolittle pulled out a small notebook and pen. 
Relax, kid, he said. I don't know why you think I want to hurt you, but I'm trying to help you find your attackers. But you... John stopped himself before saying too much. If this detective wasn't the man who attacked him, he sure as hell had a doppelganger out there. But me what? Doolittle asked. Before John could say anything, the building rocked. Both he and Doolittle struggled to stay on their feet. He heard a thunderous roar and attempted to stay upright. Then, a bright light took him away. Chapter 8 Everything was black. Oddly, he couldn't feel his body. He couldn't feel anything. He just floated in darkness. Where am I? He thought. He turned his head to see his surroundings, but he didn't have a physical head to turn, or legs to walk, or arms to sway. He was just a mass of light, but he wasn't. He was formless and couldn't see himself, but he knew he was there, wherever there was. Focus. He didn't know why he thought that, but he knew he had to. John! A voice, light and sweet, echoed in the darkness with him. John, my name, he thought. He focused on himself, forcing his arms and legs to appear. He reached up and touched his head. It was there, too. He hugged himself. He had a torso as well. Then he fell. Air flowed up from beneath him. The cold air splashed against his exposed back. That's when he noticed he was wearing a back-open gown. Then he crashed into something. Whatever it was, it was soft, yet sturdy. It didn't even move as he fell on it. His body laid across it as if it knew what to do already. It was a bed. Then his attention was drawn to a ringing noise. It was consistent, like a heartbeat. He could feel it pulsating. Open your eyes, he thought. John woke up to his phone vibrating next to him in bed. He answered it without looking at it. Hello. He said through a pool of drool. John? It was Maria. Where the hell are you? At home, he said. Where else would I be? At home? She screamed and threw Spanish slurs at him. En inglés, por favor. Why would you leave the hospital without telling anyone? We were looking for you all over the place, but we couldn't find you, she said. What? He asked. What are you talking about? John found the will to sit up and noticed he was wearing a hospital gown with his butt cheeks utterly exposed. Wait a minute, he said confused. If I was in the hospital, how did I get home? That's what I just asked you. How did you get home so fast? I went to the vending machine and when I got back you were gone. Why was I in the hospital, Maria? The explosion. You don't remember? Explosion? The accelerator. It released a wave of dark matter. Look, stay home. I'll be over in a minute. We'll talk then. Don't disappear on me again. Okay, I'll be home. John fell back on his bed, eyes glued to the ceiling, the fan above him creaking slowly until it stopped moving. Explosion, he thought. His thoughts were unclear. The movement from getting up and laying back down had given him a throbbing headache. He looked at his clock. It read 6.39 in the evening. He had missed a couple days of work. But the last thing he could remember was... Do little. It had been two days since the incident at Link Connections. Do little had been there when the accelerator exploded, releasing what the doctors told him was dark matter energy. According to doctors, it was like being hit by two atomic bombs yet everyone came out unscathed. Except for that kid, John Compton. He hit his head and had been knocked out. The captain told Doolittle to take some time off before returning to work, so he did. He went to his favorite dive, Bust One's Topless Men's Bar. The girls weren't particularly the best looking, but it was a place where Doolittle could relax. Plus, 
He needed a drink to relieve his migraine. He sat at a dimly lit table in the back, digging into some buffalo wings and washing them down with a pitcher of beer. He kept the tab open so he wouldn't have to give Shantae his card every time she brought him another pitcher and more wings. He kept his eyes on the stage, watching the dancers slide up and down the pole. They did things that he always fantasized about. Many of the girls had solicited him for a private lap dance, but he turned them down. He waited for Ava, tall, slender, supple, and built like an Amazon. Although she was slim, she was thick in the right places. She had an hourglass shape, and her hazel eyes could reel any man in. Her dance was seductive, sultry, sensual, and sexual and Doolittle was ready to pay whatever the price was to sleep with her. After she finished her set, Ava sat in the chair next to him, and the next dancer went up. Hey, she said and passed him a shot. They clanked glasses and swallowed. It was spicy and cold, but went down smooth. Ah, that's good, Doolittle said. What is it? Some new cognac they have at the bar, she said. Good, right? Real good. So, how you been? Haven't seen you in a couple days. Was in the hospital for a while after working a recent case, he said. Oh, what happened? She asked. Ava ran her hands up his thighs. She made her way up to his chest and slowly rubbed his head. Tingles and thrills pulsed through his body as his member rose with her touch. Ugh, he stuttered. You know that research facility at the end of town. Link connections? Can't say I've heard of it, she said. Well, something exploded inside. Ava gasped, pulling her hand away in shock. Are you okay? I'm here, ain't I? He said. Another girl walked over and tapped Ava on the shoulder. She was tall and slender but her massive breasts looked succulent like two ripe watermelons. Doolittle couldn't keep his eyes off them. Ava, your room is ready, the new girl said. Thanks, Cheryl, Ava said as she grabbed Doolittle by the arm to follow her. Yeah, thanks, Cheryl, he said. When they got to the private room, which was more like a booth with a single chair in it, he sat down and she started giving him a lap dance. He pulled out a wad of cash and handed it to her. She thumbed through it, smiled at him, then placed it to the side. You never let me down, honey, she said, pulling a condom out of nowhere. I never do, he said. Chapter 10 Doolittle popped the key in his apartment door and slumped face first. 10. Doolittle popped the key in his apartment door and slumped face first on the couch. The newspapers and food containers that had been there for weeks smashed under his weight. He lay there as the room spun around him. He groaned, but was happy he didn't have to report to the captain in the morning. Darkness came out and meowed before headbutting Doolittle's dangling hand. Doolittle groaned again. He looked at the little black domestic, who glared back at him with yellow eyes. Doolittle turned his head back into the couch. Feed yourself, he said. Darkness meowed. Doolittle sniffed the couch where his face had been, and then pulled himself up. Did you swear the couch? He asked Darkness. After waiting for the room to stop spinning, he walked through the mess of newspapers and cartons on the floor. He swallowed some vomit back down as he kicked candy wrappers and ice cream buckets out of his way. The roaches scattered when he threw the can of cat food on the floor. Darkness thanked him with a meow. Doolittle always told himself he would clean up, but never got around to it. He never had company and didn't really have any friends, so he had no incentive. Nothing mattered as long as his clothes were clean and smelled like he had showered. He enjoyed being alone, liked working alone, and tolerated his clutter. It helped him think clearly. He grabbed a beer out of the fridge, then went back to the couch. 
he slid the mess to the side to clear a seat for himself. A cornucopia of lottery tickets, scratchers, beer cans, and burger wrappers sat on the coffee table. He fingered through everything until he found the lottery with the current date. He kissed it. You're my ticket out of here, he said. The numbers on the orange paper read 3, 4, 15, 36, 10, and 25. He glared at it, focused on it. As he lingered on it, he couldn't look away. Something about it, whatever it was, kept him interested. His attention lingered on the date. Suddenly, the ticket felt as if it weighed hundreds of pounds, and he lost his grasp of reality as everything around him became engulfed in blinding white light. A storm hit him with strong winds from all directions at once. It felt like someone dug their nails into his mind and squeezed. He couldn't concentrate, couldn't think, couldn't breathe. The ticket was no longer in his hand. Doolittle crashed into the coffee table, breaking it in two. He groaned. Everything hurt. He threw up right there, unable to keep the vomit down. What the fuck was that? He rolled over and pushed himself up to his knees. Although his head felt like it had been ripped off, he realized there was another person in there. He felt pressure on his mind and heat fatigue, like being in a sauna. When he finally got up, he pulled his gun from his chest holster and turned it on the intruder. It was himself. Chapter 11 John refused to get up right away, so he rested in bed for a while. Maria would be here soon. Maybe he should call her back, tell her not to come, but she would cuss him out in Spanish if he did. He got out of bed and threw the hospital gown in the trash. After the shower, he surveyed himself in the mirror. Everything looked all right. His short dreadlocks looked pristine, his beard still looked good, and his brown skin didn't have any sores or bruises. Honestly, he looked great and flexed his muscles a little. Then the doorbell rang. The door. He had forgotten about it. He went to the living room to look out the peephole. The door was fixed. No, replaced. But when? He never sent a request to the maintenance man. It's Maria, she said from the other side. One sec, he said. He dashed back to his room, threw on some sweatpants and a plain t-shirt, then came back. Hey, he welcomed her in. Hey, she held up a bag with two plastic food containers. I brought food. Cool, he said. Put it on the coffee table. Maria placed the food on the coffee table, and when John came over, she hugged him. Then she slapped him and hugged him again. He just looked at her, rubbing his cheek. What was that for? How dare you leave the hospital without me? I was looking all over for you. At first I thought maybe another nurse had moved you or something, but I was the only person who had been in and out of your room. I... Who just gets up and leaves after being knocked out for two days? John Compton, that's who. No one saw you leave, not even security. It's like you just disappeared. All your shit was still in the hospital room. I brought all your shit, by the way. The only thing missing besides you, obviously, was your phone. We thought... John held her hands and looked into her eyes. Maria, I'm okay, he said. I don't have any answers for you. I don't even know how I got home. That doesn't scare you? She asked. A little. I'm trying not to think about it, he said. I feel fine, mostly. Well, besides feeling like I'm hungover. Well, I might have a cure for that. Maria took the plastic containers out of the bag and opened them to reveal a bountiful spread of tacos and fries. There was chicken, carne asada, and carnitas. It was heaven. You're the best, he said with a grin. I know. After devouring the tacos and fries, Maria went over what happened while he was sleeping. She told him that the accelerator had malfunctioned and produced a massive amount of dark matter energy that exploded in a wave. The fire department found them unconscious, 
but they were okay once admitted to the emergency room. That detective, what's his name? She asked. Do a little, John said. He was the first one out of the hospital as far as I know. Reeves, Mike, and I all woke up around the same time. I know they released us all a day ago. She blinked back tears, took a deep breath, and composed herself. <sighs> so, you remember nothing? The last thing I remember was being harassed by Doolittle. Then, next thing you know, I'm waking up in my bed in a hospital gown. Well, I'm just glad you're okay. So you want to see what's on Netflix? Sure. You pick. He tossed her the remote to his flat screen. Of course, she picked the first science documentary that popped up. John noticed she was asleep before it ended, so he got up so she could lie across the couch, then grabbed the blanket off his bed and covered her. He sat on the floor and flipped through the channels until he found a news report on the explosion at Link Connections. It triggered a citywide blackout that lasted a couple hours. Several people were injured, but no deaths. Damn he said. John went through the other bag Maria had brought with her. He pulled out his wallet, empty as always, his clothes and the shoes he wore the day of the explosion. But what he pulled out next was perplexing. It was his keys. He looked at the door, the new door. These were the old keys. He tried them in the lock, but they didn't work. How did he get inside? He looked around his entire apartment. There were no keys to the new door. He sat back down on the floor. Maria hummed in her sleep. He thought about the man who kicked his door off the hinge and tried to kill him. The man that looked like Doolittle. Then he thought about the man who saved him. The man who looked like himself. The more he thought about it, the more he realized that it wasn't just some look-alike. Somehow, John knew that was him. Chapter 12 The following day, John woke up on the floor between his coffee table and his couch. Sunlight peeked through his blinds. Maria was laid out in a puddle of her own drool. He shook her. Hey, it's morning. He poked her. Huh? She rose slowly and wiped the drool from her mouth. Then with her eyes barely open, she looked around the couch for her phone. What time is it? She asked. Can you call my phone? John went to his room to grab his phone, but was shocked at the time. It's almost one o'clock, he said. Are you serious? She said. Reeves is gonna kill us. He's going to kill you, Maria said. He loves me. John dialed Maria's number, and her music blared from her purse. She sprang up, grabbed it, and swiped through the screen. John skipped to his bathroom, slammed the door, and let out a long stream. Maria banged on the door, startling him. Hey, I have a couple of missed calls from him and a few texts saying to call him back. John washed his hands and brushed his teeth before opening the door. He smiled. Ready. I need a towel. Maria asked. For what? To dry off after I shower. You think I'm going to work smelling like your couch? The rest of her rant was in Spanish. John grabbed an extra towel. She snatched it out of his hands and slammed the bathroom door in his face. Okay, he said. He swiped through his phone and waited for her to finish. There were 13 missed calls, all from Reeves. Yet there was only one text. I need to speak to you and Maria immediately, it read. Once Maria was ready to go, they headed out. Maria stopped before they reached the sidewalk. She placed a hand on John's shoulder. Hey, she said, you can stay home if you're not feeling 100%. I'm okay. John saw the concern in her eyes. He smiled. Besides, rent is due in a few weeks and I can't afford to be fired. Okay. She said, my car is this way. It was hours before the afternoon rush, so the streets were relatively calm. As they made their way to Maria's car, John felt like he couldn't keep his balance. 
The sidewalk seemed to bend and twist under his feet. A pressure overwhelmed his thoughts, causing him to fall on his hands and knees. Maria said something, but the static in his ears muted her voice. His vision warped, and everything blurred white. John wanted nothing but to lie down. Suddenly, he was back in his bed. Chapter 13 No headache, no dizziness, no ringing in his ear, yet a faint breeze seemed to come and go. He was hyperventilating. What just happened? He hurried to the bathroom to splash water on his face. He felt hot and could feel the sweat on his forehead. Someone was screaming his name from outside the building. She looked around before looking up toward the apartment, catching his eyes. John? She yelled. However, before she could say anything else, he turned to leave. Then he was instantly back on the sidewalk. Dios mio! She screamed as he appeared suddenly in front of her. How did you... She looked up at the apartment, then back at him. He shrugged. I don't know. People gathered around them, whispering and pointing. Dude, that was fucking awesome! A kid yelled from across the street. Let's go back to the apartment, Maria whispered. Yeah. But then he was immediately back in the living room when he turned around. He swallowed the vomit that tried to erupt from his gut. A brief gust of wind burst into the room, and Maria suddenly appeared in front of him. You can teleport, he said. There was this ripple in the air where you teleported, she said. I could both see it and not see it. I touched it, and then here I was with you. Music from Maria's phone startled them. She reached in her purse, pulled it out, then showed it to John. It's Reeves. Answer it, John replied. She got up, walked to the kitchen, and answered the call. After a brief exchange, she hung up. Well, John asked. He said to meet him at work. John was back on the floor, between his coffee table and his couch. Sunlight peeked through his blinds. When he jumped to his feet, Maria was already up. She wore a blank expression on her face, as if she wasn't mentally present. He shook her, and she snapped out of it. What just happened? John asked. How am I back in the clothes I woke up in? We didn't teleport this time, she said. What do you mean? It feels like deja vu, but only real. What? John said. You know how you can feel deja vu? Well, this is more like we saw deja vu. I don't think we moved from these spots since waking up. So, did any of that actually happen? Did we really teleport? He asked. I don't know. John paced back and forth across his living room. This is freaky, he said. No shit. Music from Maria's phone startled them. Her hand shook as she dug in her purse for it. She sighed, then showed it to John. <sighs> right on cue. Damn, John replied. So it was like precognition. Should I answer? She asked. Might as well. She answered the call, and after a brief exchange, she hung up. Same as the vision, John asked. She nodded. Chapter 14 Nothing looked out of place when they arrived at Link Connections, except for the yellow police tape across the entrance. John pointed to it. Look at that, he said. I'll drive around back. As she turned the corner, someone in a trench coat and a hoodie watched them. Time seemed to stand still as John noticed this person, but couldn't see their face. Suddenly, he felt that immense pressure on his mind again and looked away. When he looked back up, the man was gone. Did you? He saw Maria press hard against her temples with her fingers. 
stupid migraine won't go away, she said. Yeah, I have one too. They pulled into the back parking lot, entering through the rear exit that had only ever been used to take out the trash. As John followed Maria into the building, he looked back briefly, catching the man in the trench coat a distance away. But when he looked again, the man wasn't there. Everything okay? Maria asked. Yeah, John said. Thought I saw something. They arrived at Reeves' office to find him behind a virtual screen. He wrote things in a notepad as the screen displayed the current stock market figures. Numbers rose and dropped sporadically. Come on in, he said. With the wave of a hand, the projected screen disappeared. John and Maria each took a seat. The authorities shut down the facility, pending an investigation. City officials have safety concerns after the explosion caused a citywide blackout and will not approve any more research or testing, Reeves said. It doesn't help that we put a detective in the hospital, albeit for a couple of hours. So technically, we're not even supposed to be in the building. Then why have us meet you here? Maria asked. She and John shared a look. Because of this, Reeves said. He pushed his notebook forward. John grabbed it, turned it around, and read the numbers, times, and dates. What is this? He asked. Reeve sighed. Ah, of course you would know what it is. Maria picked up the notebook and glanced at it. These are stock price predictions, she said. This is the reason for calling us here? The reason I called you here is for the same reason he can teleport, and you have precognition. Reeves said. The room fell silent. Jean and Maria just looked at each other. Let me guess, Reeves said. Since waking up yesterday, you felt this weird pressure in your head, similar to a migraine, but not as painful. I've been feeling it too, so I came here to investigate. Then, as the pressure relaxed, I was back home. You teleported? Maria asked. No, it was something more egregious. I realized that all my clocks were at the same time they had been when I left. Everything had been as it was before I left. People, animals, things, events. I had rewound time. Chapter 15 Bullshit, John said. He headed for the door. Wait, Maria chased after him. This is all getting a bit too freaky for me, John said. It's freaky for me too, but we can at least talk to each other about it. Try to make sense of what's going on. <sighs> okay, John sighed. Prove it, Reeves. Show us you can rewind time. <laughs> Prove it, Reeves laughed. What do you think I'm doing now? We've had this conversation multiple times already. How else would I know about the teleporting you displayed outside your apartment? Or the fact you both saw it before it happened and changed the outcome by answering my call? John, come on. Reeves is making sense for a situation that makes little sense, Maria said. Seeing is believing, John said. The room fell into an eerie silence. John and Maria just looked at each other, seeming to communicate without words. Let me guess, Reef said. Since waking up yesterday, you felt this weird pressure on your head. Me too. But once I noticed the pressure and relaxed, I was back home. You teleported? Maria asked. No, I had rewound time. Bullshit. John headed for the door. Wait. Maria chased after him. This is all getting a bit too... John paused. Freaky for me. What's wrong? She asked. I just... Deja vu, I think. He said. Prove it, Reeves. Show us you can rewind time. <laughs> Prove it. Reeves laughed. Are you serious? I already have. We've already had this conversation multiple times. Wait a minute, Maria said. What do you mean we've had this conversation multiple times? Bullshit, John said. Then why are we here? She and John exchanged a look. Because of this, Reeves said. 
He slid the notebook across the table, and John grabbed it. This time, it wasn't stock figures, but a transcript of their conversation. From the time they walked into the building to that very moment, the last entry said, Is this proof enough? Chapter 16 John threw the notebook down, jumped out of his seat, and paced the room. He couldn't believe it, and assumed the teleporting had only happened in his mind. He thought the premonition was just his overactive imagination, trauma from the threat of his life the other day. Maria came over to comfort him, but turned to look at Reeves, who sat behind his desk. I remember, John said. Why do I remember everything? I'm not too sure, said Reeves. I remember it too, Maria said. It reminds me of the feeling I had after the vision in his apartment, like deja vu. Maybe, Reeves stated. And this is just a theory. But maybe when we are close to one another, we share powers. Oh, we're calling them powers now, John said. That seems plausible, Maria said. There's only one problem. What's that? said Reeves. We don't know which one of us controls the teleportation and which one of us controls the precognition. Teleport, Reeves pointed to John. What? Why? John asked. You should teleport first, since you did it outside the apartment first. Then, if you can teleport back, we can safely assume you are the one with the teleportation powers. John looked at Maria and nodded, and then closed his eyes. He focused, visualized, and brought an image to his mind. When he opened his eyes, he was back in his apartment. Holy shit, he said. He laughed. In awe of his newfound powers, he closed his eyes and thought of Reeves' office. Thought of Maria. Then he was back in there. That was amazing, she said. Marvelous, Reeves replied. John used the desk to hold himself up. He felt nauseous. Uh, I'm going to have to get used to that. He swallowed some vomit trying to erupt from his mouth. Your turn, he said to Maria. Okay. Maria rubbed her hands together in anticipation. Then she vanished. Chapter 18 Doolittle's head felt like someone's nails were dug into his mind. As he heaved in and out, trying to catch his breath, he knew someone else was in the room. He felt for his gun holster on his side and slid the pistol out. He turned, raising the gun to the intruder, but was shocked by who he saw. It was him, or at least someone who resembled him, but the lightness was uncanny. The other him, the doppelganger just stood in his long trench coat over a black hoodie. He wore simple black slacks and boots and didn't look like a detective. Instead, he was much older, with visible grays in most of his beard and a head that barely had hair. What are you doing in my home? Doolittle asked. Our, said the doppelganger. What? Our home, he said. This is interesting. I know I can move forward in time, but traveling thirty years into the future, I'm impressed. The man sounded like him too. Just like him. Doolittle was confused. Had Ava slipped him a hallucinogen? No, she wouldn't do that. So, had he finally gone crazy? This him, whoever he was, was obviously standing there. Was it the machine? That particle accelerator had it done something to his mind. His hand shivered at the thought of it. He tried to keep it steady while using his free hand to fish for cuffs from his pockets. I can assure you, your mind isn't playing tricks on you, the man said. What the fuck are you talking about? Doolittle asked. I'm you, just 33 years older. 33 years wiser, <laughs> he said with a brief laugh. I don't give a shit who the fuck you think you are. I'm taking you in for breaking and entering, Doolittle said, producing the cuffs. Oh, really? The man said. 
But when Doolittle blinked, the man vanished. He was now behind Doolittle on the other side of the television. How did you... Doolittle asked with his gun aimed at the man. Like I said, wiser, the man mocked. Put these on. Doolittle tossed the cuffs, but they disappeared right out of the air. The man was no longer behind the television. Instead, Doolittle found himself laying against the floor, spinning the cuffs on one finger. Ah, I remember when I first figured it out too. Only, I don't remember being as confused as you are, he said. That night, sitting in that shitty apartment, staring at that lotto ticket, I went 30 days into the future, not 30 years. Stop, Doolittle demanded. How are you doing this? Doolittle could no longer fight it as his hand shook. He was confused, angry, and most of all, scared. This man, his older self, was doing things, disappearing and reappearing in a matter of seconds. But how, he thought. What do you want from me? Doolittle put the gun back in his holster. What could a gun do if this man could snatch the cuffs out of thin air without Doolittle ever seeing him do it? From you? The man said. Nothing. But you see that? The older him pointed at nothing. But as Doolittle's eyes adjusted, he noticed a ripple in the air right where he had crashed on the floor. It reminded him of a wave in water starting from a center point that spread outward. It was about the size of his body. That, young me, is what I like to call a time scar, the older Doolittle said. A what? Doolittle asked. A time scar. The point at which you came into the future is also the point which pulled you back. What do you mean, came into the future? Doolittle asked. I forgot, the older Doolittle said. This is the first time for you. That means... The older future Doolittle headed towards him. He went for his gun again, but it was gone. When he looked up, it was in the older Doolittle's hand. Everyone is still alive in your timeline. And John Compton hasn't gone into hiding yet. The older Doolittle fired the gun at his younger self. The bullet struck him in the leg. Doolittle screamed, fell to the floor, and clutched his leg. It's nothing personal, me, the older Doolittle said as he walked through the center of the time scar and disappeared. The ripples dissipated as he passed through. No, Doolittle yelled. He crawled over to where the time scar had been, blood trailing behind him from his leg, but he no longer saw the ripples. It, along with his future self, was gone, and he was there, injured and stuck. Chapter 19 John and Reeves found Maria's and Michael's bodies in a puddle of blood on the control room floor. We should call the police. John choked out. Y yeah Reeve stuttered. When they turned around to leave, there was another in the control room. He wore a trench coat over his black hoodie and carried a gun in his left hand. He locked eyes with John. John froze as a chill ran down his spine. He knew who this was and who it wasn't. It was the same eyes, the eyes of someone who wanted him dead. It was the man who attacked that morning in the apartment. Doolittle, Reeve said. But John knew this wasn't the same Doolittle. He looked older and meaner than the simple detective that had tried to interrogate him. Somehow, John knew this Doolittle didn't belong here. But before he could do anything, Doolittle had the gun locked on him. John closed his eyes and focused. When he opened them, it was in the building's lobby. He headed for the door, but stopped when he heard scuffling coming from the accelerator area. Reeves he thought. He focused and was instantly back in the control room. Reeves had Doolittle pinned against the wall, but a punch from Doolittle sent him to the ground. Doolittle shot Reeves in the shoulder. John tackled Doolittle to the ground, 
caught off guard, the gun flew from his hand and flung a few feet away. They both scrambled for it, but Reeves stopped Doolittle by grabbing his leg. Doolittle kicked Reeves in the face to release the grip, but John had the gun aimed at him when he got up. John held the gun as firmly as he could. Doolittle hocked a loogie on the ground. You okay? John asked Reeves. Besides being an excruciating pain, he said, I'm peachy. With the gun pointed at Doolittle, John helped Reeves to his feet. He was bleeding from his nose and shoulder. I know you attacked me two days ago, John said. You fool, Doolittle said. If you think I'm the same man that came to your apartment, you are wrong. What are you talking about? John asked. Look at him. Reeves plopped onto a nearby chair. He's obviously much older. This Doolittle may be from the future. You gotta be fucking kidding me, John said. What's your deal? Reeves asked. My deal is him. Doolittle nodded at John, who still had the gun. For me, he's the one that got away, he continued. In my time, he and I are the last two left. What are you talking about? John asked. It's been 30 years, but we made ourselves rich when we first discovered our powers. Then we tried to do good and change the world. <laughs> we called ourselves chrononauts. Many believed that we were dangerous, so we had enemies. When together, we were like gods. But when separated, we were vulnerable. Michael was the first to go in my time. How do you kill a man who can slow down time to where his movements look instantaneous? They trapped him. But with his death came a new discovery. We shared his power among the rest of us. I don't understand, John said. But you will, Doolittle said. This gift, these powers, they aren't individual. They are linked. We were, are linked. So when one of us dies, their power is split among the survivors? Reeves asked. Once I realized our enemies would never stop hunting us, I freed you all from a life of pain and misery. You killed them. Us. In your time. In your past. John said. Yes. Doolittle said. All except for you. When you found out what I had done, you ran away. Teleported disappeared. I faced our enemies alone, but you have been missing for years. Well, I'm sure that'll make a good prison story. Reeves struggled to pull out his cell phone, but used his good arm to dial 911. This isn't making any sense. We just figured out what we can do, John said. How did you get here from the future? Me, Doolittle said. Your Doolittle came to my time using his power. So, trapped him in the future that will no longer exist, and came back here in his place. How? Why? Reeves asked. To find and kill me, John said. So he can get the one power he doesn't have, to be the only chrononaut left. Yes. After I kill you, I can start over. Shape the world in my image. Become a god. John couldn't believe it. This was all to satiate Doolittle's obsession with being the only one with powers from the very beginning. Maria's death, Michael's death, and even the younger Doolittle were all victims of this menace. A wall of grief washed over John. Reeves was already speaking with the police. Doolittle looked to be waiting for a moment to attack. John wanted to fix this. But how? Reeves could rewind time. They could warn Michael and Maria before Doolittle arrives. Then, Doolittle attacked. Chapter 20 Chapter 20 Doolittle rushed John. John fired. The shot grazed Doolittle in the shoulder, but he didn't stop. He punched John in the face and grabbed the gun. After throwing John to the ground, Doolittle hit him again and snatched the gun away. Before he could shoot, Reeves grabbed him. Get out of here! Reeves yelled. 
but Doolittle twisted and freed himself. A pistol whipped to Reeves' mouth drove him back. Then, Doolittle fired. One, two, three, four, five rounds into Reeves' chest. His body fell to the ground right in front of John. Blood gurgled in Reeves' mouth as he tried to say something, but it was too late. His lifeless eyes stared at John. Doolittle aimed the gun at John. John closed his eyes and focused. Suddenly, everything that had just happened flashed before his eyes. He felt weightless as everything became engulfed in darkness. The air felt like it was being pulled from his lungs and a wave of dizziness hit him. When John opened his eyes, Reeves, Maria's, and Michael's bodies were gone. It was just him, Doolittle, and the particle accelerator. What did you do? Doolittle pulled the trigger, but it jammed. He lunged for John's throat, but John teleported. He was outside of Link Connections. It was bright out, and he assumed it was early. He attempted to do what Reeves had done and rewind time, but he didn't know how far back he had to rewind it. He felt a burst of wind as Doolittle appeared next to him. Doolittle attacked him, but John teleported again. He tried to put distance between himself and Doolittle, but Doolittle used the ripples he left behind to chase after him. Doolittle fired shots at John, but he teleported out of the way. Unfortunately, the pedestrians were shot. People screamed and ran in all directions to get away from the killer in the trench coat. I'll kill you! Doolittle screamed. He teleported in front of John and clotheslined him with a forearm. John slammed onto the pavement. Doolittle then picked him up and tossed him into a newspaper stand. Papers, magazines, and postcards flew in all directions. Doolittle shot the vendor when he tried to say something. It was pandemonium. John tried to crawl away. Doolittle grabbed the newspaper out of the air, looked at it, and laughed. <laughs> you idiot, he said. You just made it that much easier for me. He tossed the gun and vanished. People were on their phones attempting to explain to 911 what happened. Disoriented, John got up with the gun, tucked it behind his back, and grabbed the newspaper. When he saw the date, he realized the mistake he had made. 21. John focused, and instantly he was back in his apartment. Debris from the door being kicked in was everywhere. Doolittle was on top of someone with his hands around their neck. It was him. It was surreal. John couldn't believe it. He rewound time back to the morning when Doolittle attacked him. That Doolittle then was this Doolittle now. Would killing John in the past erase him from the future? Erase himself now? He didn't want to find out. He grabbed Doolittle from behind with a chokehold and squeezed with all his strength. Doolittle struggled, sending elbows and punches to John's ribs and face. John refused to let go. He had to think quickly. Where could he be safe? Where could he stop this maniac? John closed his eyes. John opened his eyes before he let go of Doolittle. His plan had worked. Doolittle backed away with a hand to his throat. Where is this? He asked as he surveyed his surroundings. They were inside a massive dome-like structure with many nodes emitting electricity protruding inward. Thousands of feet of wire wrapped around each node. John vomited everything he held in and then dropped to the floor. It was over. Although one could see the end of the structure, running across this immense space would take a while. Doolittle dropped to a knee, a look of disdain on his face as he glared at John. What is this place? He asked. The inside of the particle accelerator, John answered. Doolittle tried to teleport, but couldn't. John watched as his skin paled with every passing moment. It's the radiation, John said. 
This thing emits a ton of radiation. I give us an hour before we die. Why aren't my powers working? Doolittle asked. Shit, I don't know. You killed all the people that could have answered that. John tried to teleport too, but his powers weren't working either. Tears trickled from his eyes as he thought about the others. He looked at Doolittle. The man no longer looked menacing. He just looked old as he coughed and hacked up blood. I guess it was only a matter of time. <laughs> he laughed between coughs. I regret nothing. Then, John pulled out the gun and fired. The bullet flew past Doolittle's head to strike some part of the machine behind him. <laughs> you missed. Doolittle mocked. Did I? The accelerator shook, groaned, and rumbled. Then lights flickered inside of it. John felt his body heating as if he were inside a giant microwave. Protons and electrons passed through as his atoms were being split apart. Doolittle screamed as his flesh boiled up, popped, and burst. Then Doolittle's body combusted from the inside out and disintegrated into the air. The energy inside the accelerator exploded. John closed his eyes and he let the light take him. Yeah. If you stay ready, and gotta get ready. Nothing you can tell me. My arm and heavy. I'm shooting machetes. It go through your belly. I cast my celly. I steal my celly. You soft for the teddy. I'm getting this money. I'm talking my fatty. You niggas is petty. I move like a Chevy. And my weight is heavy. And bitch, I'm from Compton. You niggas is...